I'm uh, from a normal middle class home, but I was subjected to sexual abuse in the family, and I wasn't the only one. And uh, that created problems with uh, emotional regulation and with mental health and uh, a tremendous amount of anxiety and a lot of fear. And then, of course, I took that persona into school where I was sort of bullied relentlessly because I was an obvious target. But in the midst of that, my, my mother and her second husband announced they were getting a divorce and we had no place to live anymore. The next year, I found my way into a community of people who very slowly and then more quickly devolved into um, a brainwashing cult. So I lived in that brainwashing cult for seven years until I was 29 years old. So it's sort of a culmination of the first part of my life where I was just subject to pretty much constant forms of terror and abuse in one way or another. Welcome to Linda's Corner, where we bring more hope, healing, and happiness to the world. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about overcoming trauma, anxiety, self-doubt, and low self-esteem. I'm delighted to welcome John Labman. John is an author, licensed massage therapist, master in counseling psychology, the director of a trauma treatment program, and a licensed professional counselor. You can reach John at his website, simplyawake.com, and I'll include that link in the show notes. Welcome, John. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Thank you, Linda. I'm really delighted to be here. I'm and I want to um, to make sure that your audience knows that they should give you a five star rating and uh, like and subscribe if they aren't already subscribing, because that's how they get educated and others get educated in how to really be a human being since we don't learn that in school. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And that creates such a win win scenario, doesn't it? Yeah. It's like we're here. We're donating our time our skills, our efforts to help benefit other people. And right. it's not that hard to give a little bit back. Something as simple as let's give a review. Let's say something that I appreciated this and I want to hear a little bit more. So thank you so much for bringing that up. You're welcome. And I am so excited to be learning from you today. Someone who has so many um, certificates and degrees. I, I couldn't even name them all in my short little intro. And one of mm. them that intrigues me the most is that you have certificates from Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. So I have to do a little fangirling here that uh -huh. um, like you, you know your stuff. And not only do you know it from education and training, but from experience. And I think Go when on. you put those two together, you create something amazing. So people, listen to John. He knows what he's talking about. So is it okay if we let people know a little bit about your background and your story? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess some of the the lowlights and highlights may be, I mean, I'm almost 70. So right, it's, it's not a quick story. But um, I'm uh, from a normal middle class home, but I was subjected to sexual abuse in the family. And I wasn't the only one. And uh, that created problems with uh, emotional regulation and with mental health and uh, a tremendous amount of anxiety and a lot of fear. And then, of course, I took that persona into school where I was sort of bullied relentlessly because I was an obvious target. One of the highlights of my early life was um, around 15, somebody came to the 10th grade of my local uh, public school and showed a bunch of us a film about an international school on the south seacoast of Wales. And for some reason, I jumped up out of my seat and ran down to the front of the room and applied for that scholarship. And um, I was just at that time really beginning a journey of faith. And so, but I prayed like crazy and I said, okay, God, please give me the scholarship and get me into the school and get me out of this kind of hellish terrain that I'm living in. And I got into the school. And at that point, that became became like the starting point of a conscious journey of faith. And I was also just beginning to dip my toes into going to a psychotherapist for problems, although I was not an eager candidate at the time, I should say. And uh, I thought when I, I went to school abroad that that would solve all my problems, which, of course, it didn't. So fast forward, I uh, continued my journey of faith. I graduated from that school. I went to Haverford College on the main line outside of Philadelphia. Um, 
I was not out as a gay man at that time. I didn't even know what that really meant. And um, uh, by the end of the semester, after studying the work of Immanuel Kant, The Critique of Pure Reason, I found myself in an early state of the dissolving of the self and reality, which uh, when you don't have any context for it, you just think you're going crazy. So um, after that semester, I left school for a while. I ended up finishing school at a, at a denominational Christian college down south. But in the midst of that, my, my mother and her second husband announced they were getting a divorce and we had no place to live anymore. So the kids were all on our own. And the next year, I found my way into a community of people who very slowly and then more quickly devolved into um, a brainwashing cult. So I lived in that brainwashing cult for seven years until I was 29 years old. And by the end of that, they were telling all of the members that we had, in spite of the fact that we were dedicated to God, that we had committed some sort of uh, secret, unpardonable sin, and that we were all going to be excommunicated. So at the very end of my time there, I spent, you know, four or five months pacing the floors in my little shared house that I shared with six other guys or five other guys, wondering what I was going to do. I was told that if I stayed and went back into the church, uh, which we had to rebuild because somebody tried to burn it down, we think one of the ex-members, um, if I went back into that church and hadn't um, disclosed my secret sin, I would be doubly damned to hell. If I left, having told them that I thought my secret sin was gay and they didn't think that was the thing because I'd never acted on it, or if I were to leave the church, then I would get AIDS and die and go to hell. So for a couple of months, I just walked back and forth with what we know is sort of a double bind now where I, there wasn't anything I could do that was the right thing anymore. And that had sort of been the story of my life growing up in, you know, in sexual abuse at home where somebody says they love you and then they abuse you. And then in being bullied, you know, where you're trying to make friends all the time, but they abuse you. So it's sort of a culmination of the first part of my life where I was just subject to pretty much constant forms of terror and abuse in one way or another. And so that was the early life, um, even though 30 doesn't sound like early. Uh, when you get to almost 70, then it does feel like it was the early life. And at that point, I began a much more conscious spiritual journey. I had to figure out whether what they said was really true, whether I was going to go to hell because I disobeyed them. I also had to figure out whether I was gay or not because I had never acted on it. And I had to find out what my own spirituality really was. And so um, once I left the church, I um, it was a very tumultuous time. I was um, in a lot of trouble. I had very little money. I still had a job, but you know, I wasn't sleeping well and all that. So I did go to therapy and I started working with a therapist who really, I think, was the catalyst for me to become a therapist in my life later. She taught me that if I was showing up to see her every week and I was driving like 90 minutes one way to see her, um, since I was showing up there, I must have some hope to be alive and to make a life. And it was very, very clever because she wasn't telling me what to do like the church had told me to do. She was showing me within myself there was something already there that was speaking to me that was saying, hey, there's some kind of hope here. You can do something with your life. Your life isn't over. And you don't necessarily have to believe what these people who brainwashed you told you. And so before long, I was out of the closet. I moved out of the area where the cult was. I, I left my job. I eventually found my way to New York City uh, because I had a, a a kind of an itch to be an actor and singer and a performer at that time. Uh, many musicians in my family, my late father was in the National Symphony Orchestra for many, many years. My brothers are both musicians. My sister was a dancer. My mother was a showroom model. But there's all this you know, performance energy in the family. And I was a singer and I was very, I trained starting at the age of about 15. And when I was abroad in Wales, I trained with a, a well-known Welsh tenor. 
Um, and then I had these great New York coaches who said, wow, you know, you have a voice worthy of Broadway, but you need to learn the method acting. You need to, you know, learn to be uh, acting the way Brando and Marilyn Monroe did. And so I moved to New York, took a job in an art gallery and went to went to acting school, dancing school, voice lessons. And after a couple of years, I realized I hated performing. The business to me was terribly sleazy. I didn't want any parts of that. And I left that and kind of drifted for a couple of years until I found my way into the Eastern spiritual traditions. Uh, because one of my voice teachers um, called me one day and he said, hey, there are some people here who are teaching how to live in the present moment, not just on stage where I'd learned in, in method acting. That's that was the exciting way to experience emotion on stage, you know, really living and, and acting just based on a simple line, interacting with another person, feeling more alive than I'd ever felt in my life. And that began the spiritual path that I've been on since, uh, very much directly in the Eastern traditions, uh, Enlightenment traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism. And um, it also, the people that I met with in New York, um, they combined massage therapy, very deep tissue work, breath work, and counseling. They did all three with everybody. And so I thought, okay, kind of. Let me rescue what I learned from my first therapist. I want to do what they're doing. And so what I did first was I went to massage therapy school and I became a licensed massage therapist to learn all about the body and all about my own bodily responses. And I had learned a lot about emotion from, from acting school because I knew nothing about thought or emotion from growing up. And then eventually I took a three-year program in psychic and energetic healing. And I learned how to do energy healing with people, but I didn't like it because I felt like the people who were being healed were disempowered. They weren't doing their own healing on themselves. And just like I had been, you know, told what to do all my life by this cult for seven years, I'm like, you know, this doesn't make me comfortable. So I went right away after that to graduate school. I did an adult program in counseling psychology. and. As I was finishing my degree, I also took a 500-hour certification in yoga teacher training. And it was only many years later, when I was already a therapist, that I worked with Bessel van der Kolk um, at the agency that I was working in in those days where I was director of the Trauma Treatment Project. And I got a certificate in traumatic studies from Bessel and a whole team of wonderful PhD people, many of whom taught at Harvard and Boston University. and so. Gradually, I worked my way from massage therapist to energy healer to counselor. And my thesis in graduate school is on the combination of yoga and psychotherapy. So could yoga nicely dovetail with psychotherapy? And in fact, it does. It does beautifully. And so very shortly after the yoga teacher training, I had my own initial spiritual awakening into what's called Kensho or first awakening, where you disidentify from the mind and its chatter, and you identify as the deep awareness that's aware of everything that arises in the mind, and is also aware of all the other senses that are constantly pouring information in. And that spiritual awakening produced a kind of hybridization of my work. So what I do for people like your audience is why do you believe that you're the thoughts that they're dancing through your head? And do you realize that nobody taught you that a lot of your thoughts are false, folks? I want to say this to the audience, too. We don't get any education, Linda, in being human beings. Nobody teaches us, hey, most of the thoughts that arise in your mind aren't even true. And you're living your life based on these thoughts in your mind that aren't even true. And by the way, a lot of your feelings, your emotions, they feel physiologically very real. But just like I could produce them from a story in my head when I was in acting class, I can make up all kinds of wonderful emotions from all kinds of false information that my mind is generating. And so I started to teach people, hey, you know, you ought to question what you're thinking and you ought to question where your emotions are coming from you start to understand that a lot of your thoughts are false 
and a lot of then a lot of the emotional suffering that comes with them is unnecessary and can just be dropped. And once people learn that a lot of their thoughts are false and are causing them trouble, and that their emotions, a lot of them are unnecessarily making them suffer, then they've got all kinds of bandwidth cleared away to start discovering their true spiritual nature. And also using meditation and mindfulness, then I can help people to say, hey, you know how a lot of your thoughts aren't really true? Well, your identity as a thought-making voice in your head, that thing that you think of as a self, that isn't actually what you are. So that's a long and very short version of of my life as as up to now, Linda. Thanks for listening. It's such a long story, but you know, I try to condense as much as I can. It is tricky to try to condense 70 years into any kind of coherent small thing that's not in real time. Right. And some of the things that you brought up that just I think are so important to reiterate, because we can't probably catch on everything, mm-hmm. is one thing is that we have unnecessary suffering. Oh, so much of it. It's unnecessary. Yeah. And that, I think that's important. That's an important concept for us to be able to understand. Yeah. Not that our suffering isn't real. But Oh, no, it's very physiologically real. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And that means that there is a way to let it go. We don't that's right. have to suffer. And you have gone through many, many experiences that are common, some that are very unique. Mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating that um, drama training is actually part of your learning curve. And I liked how you brought it up a couple different times. One is being present in the moment, and another is the emotions and how you recognize that these can be real or that they can be manufactured. And so to be able to recognize hey, wait a minute, if I can produce an emotion on a stage or Mm -hmm. in front of a camera, does that mean that some of my emotions that I'm feeling that are very real actually came from something that I created? Not from the outside world, not from my experiences, but from me, from the inside. I also found it very fascinating that as you're working your way through and and probably looking for answers as you go along, there are some different uh, experiences that you had where people who are trying to help or pretending to help are coming very much from, let me fix you. Let me tell you exactly what you should be thinking, what you should be feeling. Mm. And if you don't follow what I say, you're going to hell. In fact, you know, I basically control you if you don't listen to everything that I say. And the things that actually really made a difference was when someone gave the idea of, you know what, let's look inside, inside of you, John. You have hope. There's hope in you. I can see it. And here is evidence that what I am seeing is real. That evidence is you showed up. And by saying and, and helping you to realize what was already inside, that's so much more empowering. And I loved how you mentioned later that even when you're working with energy work, Part of what made you feel dissatisfied is, I want to empower people to recognize their own role, their own power in healing. Not that you're coming to someone who's going to fix you, but that you are awakening the power within you. So I would love to kind of continue on that a little bit. Sure. Can you help our listeners to become aware? and to awaken the healing powers within them. I can, and I think the simplest way to do that is is something that I did with a client here a couple of weeks ago. His struggles with, he's just been a workaholic. He's just been working tough all of his life. And he, he's uh, had so much stress lately that he's been using a little too much alcohol to get to sleep at night. And so we did an exercise in the office, which I can invite our listeners to do with us right now, which is to just 
Um, uh, I won't close my eyes and you don't have to close yours if you don't want, since we're host and guest, but audience members, you can close your eyes. And instead of listening to what your mind is saying right now, whatever that is, see if you can listen to any of the sounds in the room that you're sitting in or the car or the train, if you're on the train, feel the chair under you, feel your weight, your adult weight on the chair, especially if you're a trauma survivor, feeling your adult weight on the chair, really empowering. Feel your feet on the ground. Feel the air, whatever the air temperature is, as it moves past you, or you're just kind of sitting in the ambient air. And keep coming back to those senses. And if your attention wants to wander back into some thought, what I want you to do is just keep bringing your attention back to your senses and the sensory information, even to feel if you're sitting in a chair and feel the arms of the chair under your fingers, or just even to touch with your hand as I'm doing the side of your face with your hand, feel the coolness or warmness of your hand and your face. And now as we're just sitting kind of bathed in all those senses, take a couple of nice deep breaths through the nose and let them out a little more slowly than you took them in. Keep feeling all those sensory feelings that are coming into your awareness. Another breath. You can just stop there and you may notice if you sort of took your pulse before we started and you're taking it now, you may feel somewhere between 1% and 5% more relaxed than you were just about two minutes ago. And the way that I begin to help people is for me to put them back in touch with their bodies. My training as a massage therapist, after all, and their senses and their emotions. And to pull them out of thought, because the thing about thought is that all thought is only a reflection of reality. It is not reality. So all thought, by its very essential nature, is kind of a falsehood. And if you want to be in contact with the safety of the present moment, which is where all trauma heals and where all emotion can get calmed, all you have to do is come back to your physical senses and feel those physical senses. Give yourself enough air so that you're not um, hypoxic, which means you're not getting enough oxygen, because the oxygen really helps too. And in that very, very little bit of an example, that's more or less how I'm going to work with people and how I work with people and how you can work with yourself to start to realize that your most of your problems are made up out of nothing by your minds. And I have a nice little model that I use. I call it the three ring circus of your mind. And there'll be a free book for your listeners who listen until the end. And the three rings of the mind are all of your thoughts about yourself, many of which are taught to you by people who are angry with you. So they're not very positive. All your thoughts about other people, what they're saying, thinking, and doing about you. Yes, we're always worried about what they think about us. And then the third ring, if I'm just going to draw on the air, is all of your thoughts about the future. Now, although we're all divine in human form, God doesn't individually make itself omniscient when it takes human form. So we can't all predict the future. Sorry, folks. So all your thoughts about the future are lies. I can say categorically, other than the earth will continue turning on its axis and the sun will appear to rise tomorrow and the moon, all of your thoughts about the future, particularly the catastrophic ones, especially for those who've been traumatized, there's lots of catastrophic thought about the future. All of those are lies. And when you start, when you notice, oh, I've got a thought arising and it's making me nervous. Maybe the thought is, oh my gosh, that Hurricane Debbie is going to hit my home and it's going to destroy my home. Well, you'll get nervous right away from any thought that arises, particularly because most of them are false. And falsehoods, when spoken out loud, attached to a lie detector machine, produce a physiological 
response that that machine can detect. And lies generated by the mind and believed inwardly can create a similar physiological contraction. The adrenals go, you feel that little push in your stomach and your heart rate goes up and your perspiration rate goes up and your respiration rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. Suddenly you don't feel so good. So when you notice that thought, oh my gosh, Hurricane Debbie's going to hit us and destroy our house, you ask a simple question. Can I absolutely know that that thought is absolutely true? Not could it possibly happen? Could it probably happen? You know, do I wish it would happen? Do I hope it would happen? It should happen. It might happen. None of that is true. Can I absolutely know Hurricane Debbie is absolutely going to hit my home? No. I can't. It's a lie. Now, a lot of us, because we're trained in traumatic circumstances with adverse childhood experiences, in our circle one, our thoughts about ourselves, we've got a lot of lies that keep repeating and repeating and repeating. And we can use the same technique with those lies. Is it really true that I'm stupid? Is it really true that I'm ugly? Is it really true? Can I absolutely know that it's absolutely true that I'm fat? Can I absolutely know that it's absolutely true that I'm worthless? I had a client who used to come in and say to me, when I walk by the mirror every morning, I say to myself, you're an effing piece of crap. You're a worthless piece of crap. So people have those kinds of thoughts repeating in their minds all day long. And that makes them feel physiologically, they go into a contraction, they feel sad, they feel depressed, they feel anxious, you feel fearful about the future, because if I'm worthless, then the future is going to suck. And so we begin, we can begin to challenge those thoughts. And then we can notice that a lot when we start challenging them, we may, we may have to do it a 100 times, we may even have to use a really strong language like, that's a GD lie, or that's a GD effing lie, right? I'm going to be polite, but I use this expression for my clients. Hey, remember, that's a GDFL. That thought that you just told me out loud out of your mouth, that's a GDFL. You don't know that's true. And how does that make you feel? Usually makes you feel terrible, sad, mad, scared. Those lies don't make us feel happy, joyful, excited to be alive content, peaceful, right? Anything but. So that's really how I begin with a lot of the clients and particularly with trauma histories. People have all kinds of negative, bad messages about themselves. I had terrible messages about myself. And your audience has the same kind of bad messages. And you may have lived through them yourself, right? As a human being. Hey, because nobody teaches us that a lot of these thoughts are not true. And then nobody teaches us that the self is not really made up of thoughts. The self is a much vaster thing than thought could possibly encompass. Thought about a self is like trying to put the ocean in a glass of water. You're the ocean. You're trying to define yourself as a glass of water with all these little words and these descriptions of who you are. You can't do it. It can't be done. So there's a, a little summary of, of what I do with folks and what's in my books and and what's in the booklet, Taming the Three Ring Circus of Your Mind. And, you know, the other thing that you probably, I don't know, how do you feel about the news th these days? Is it pretty scary to watch the news or listen to it? It is. So this is another way to read the news without having a nervous breakdown. It's like, oh, wait, is this somebody's opinion? Is this somebody's analysis? Is this somebody's prediction, right? I see a lot of it as one of those things. If I notice it's one of those, I pay no attention to it, none at all. And, and I only read what I actually know is sort of factual truth, unless I want to read somebody's opinion. So that's a little bit about how the work goes. And I love doing it. And I love seeing that aha moment when people are like, oh, I don't have to believe that. No. And, oh, I don't have to suffer those terrible feelings. No. Your adrenaline 
the half-life of adrenaline in the body is just 20 minutes. So if you bust a thought that's a lie and that's created an adrenal response, your system will be, will be back to sort of calm and continuously engaged within about 20 minutes. That gives hope. That seems like a reasonable amount of time, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, I can stand 20 minutes of agitation. I can't stand a <laughs> lifetime of it. <laughs> no, I know. And a lot of people try to. And I appreciate that what our conversation is today is you don't have to. No. And as I think about your client who walked past the mirror and it's like, I am a loser. I am worthless. And yeah. I, I have felt those feelings and had those thoughts. <laughs> and as you're talking, the good news, and I hope people picked up on this, is that those thoughts are not true. Right. They're lies. So when, when we're trying to change the way that we think, we're actually trying to align our thoughts with the truth. And right. I love the example you gave of we're an ocean trying to describe ourselves as a glass, a glass yeah. of water. And usually we think of ourselves as a disgusting, dirty glass of water rather than <laughs> right, this yeah. beautiful, amazing, vast, powerful, beautiful thing. So the things that we're telling ourselves, the mm -hmm. things that we believe about ourselves are not necessarily true. That's right. And if they're bringing us misery, sadness, depression, frustration, mm -hmm. chances are they're not true. And so as we get things more aligned, you also talked about these different thoughts and where they come from. And mm -hmm. a lot of times our thoughts come from the past. They come from worrying about the future. Mm -hmm. And if we can let those go and focus on the present, then it's like, you know, when people say, oh, I have a lot on my plate. Right. And and a lot of what's on our plate is those stories that we have heard and have been telling ourselves in the past and yeah. the things that we're worrying about in the future. Mm -hmm. And if we're here and now, even for a little while, it's lighter. And you gave us a, a way to connect with the here and now. And yeah. that is through our physical senses. Now, our, right. my body, my physical me, can only exist here and now. But That's my right. mind can wander past, future, possibilities when I can bring my thoughts to my body, which is here and now, I get a break. Right, because time doesn't exist except in the mind. And that's why when we go to sleep at night, we have no sense of any passage of time. We just wake up and we're like, oh, did time pass? Oh, okay. <laughs> And likewise, we actually have no uh, sense of separation from other things. Even our visual field, we, we learn to see it in three dimensions. But actually, that's not our original experience of the visual field. We just see colors and shapes. And the mind interprets a three-dimensional world. So the mind also interprets that there's a me that's separate from a three-dimensional world. And we're all craving intimacy. We're all craving oneness. But it's really the mind that separates us from everything else. The senses don't do that. And so we can have a very, you know, a very, very intimate experience of drinking a sip of water. And you can't describe that in words. You can't describe that what that water tasted like, how cool it was to anybody, and duplicate that experience for them. They but they can become one with the experience of water just by tasting it. And so as we travel on a spiritual path from beginning to recognize that the thoughts are not true to beginning to also recognize that the self created by thoughts is not actually the self, and all the ways that we've been trying to defend ourselves egotistically, like, no, I'm not like that. You can't call me that. You can't say that about me. There may be some things about me that really are true. Like, I do have a belly now at age 69. I didn't used to, but I do now. Should I defend against that? Oh, my gosh. 
is that my identity that I have a belly now? No, it's just a description. And defending ourself as a set of ideas about me, that creates a whole lot of conflict in our lives and our relationships. And we don't need to have that conflict in our lives and relationships. We're much more at peace when we feel like we have nothing to fear and nothing to prove. That's and right. as you say, as we're trying to defend ourselves, we're trying to prove something. I, I, I have to look this way or I have no worth. Therefore, if I have a belly, I must not have worth. It's like, no, <laughs> I am. I am. Right. I have nothing to fear. I have nothing to prove. Mm. I am. And I am enough. Right. And, and, you know, even even the concept enough, even the concept or the words I am, not necessary, but useful, right? But, but I don't need to defend an identity that exists only as a set of words. It's not, it's not that important. So a lot of conflict can go away that way. And then, of course, you know, you're talking about trauma. And there are some things in the body that are just damaged permanently by trauma. And, and I, I, won't, I won't sugarcoat that. I mean, the amygdala and the hippocampus in the brain can really be adversely affected. And we don't know of anything that permanently takes all of that out of the body. I mean, there are some things that seem to. And, you know, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which I've, I've been a patient of and I learned to do, although I don't practice it now. And other things really help. Somatic experiencing really helps. Feeling the body, letting the body shake if it wants to shake. All those things can really help, right? But, but I'm living with, you know, the first half of my life was just full of trauma. And my brain is like, oh, okay. So I take a very small little bit of medicine. That's like God's gift to keep me alive and well, because even though I would consider myself liberated as a, as a soul now, the body is still subject to what the body's been through. And so we need to also allow that, that liberation or enlightenment or, you know, higher being doesn't solve every problem. And of course, you know, we still have to eat and walk, and move, and sleep well, and take care of our bodies, all that's still important, especially for the trauma survivor. They need regularity in their lives. So, you know, the way that you're talking to me, I, 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 I'm seeing that you see, know a lot about this personally. Yes. Been through it, been there, done a lot. Right. And here we are having a conversation and feeling the inadequacy of that conversation to convey what needs to take place. And yet right now, right here, it is only our words that we have to try to express. That's right. But for any of our listeners, um, both John and I, we have been through uh, hard things. I think everybody has been through hard things yeah. and have been able to find joy, peace, and fulfillment on the other side. We so, recognize from our personal experiences that we do not need to stay in a place of pain, in a place of fear. And um, that's really the invitation. I, I love that there's more than one way to do things. I love that there's more than one way to experience the healing that we need to. And as we talk to different experts and different people who have had different experiences, I, it just, I, I think, okay, this person listening is going to be, they're going to be touched by what John says. It's like, oh my gosh, somebody who finally gets me and someone else will be, oh my gosh, what Linda says, that, that just makes sense. I get it. Right. So we share, we share our different experiences, but in order to heal, it requires a personal experience. It goes beyond research into me search. And that is huh. to try we have I to love that. That's great. Yeah. For ourselves to see what, what works. So, John, I appreciate so much you visiting with me today. Is there anything else you want to make sure that we cover before we close today? Um, no, other than if your listeners who would like a free copy of my book, Taming the Three-Ring Circus of the Mind, 
they can direct message me at Instagram at John Labman. That's J O N L A B M A N with the word circus 24. And I'll be glad to respond. And if they want to have more of a conversation with me there, they may. Um, they can also find me at simplyawake.com. And the most comprehensive uh, guide to being human and waking up, that's the name of my book. And they can find that on Amazon. Thank you, John. I appreciate you You're visiting welcome. with me today. And thank you for having me. It's been such a delightful conversation. You're a great host. Thank you. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. He said, the greatest sources of our suffering are the lies we tell ourselves. Today, I invite our listeners to become aware of the lies we're telling ourselves and let them go and end our personal suffering. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. Please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. And if you'd like to heal your life from the inside out, there is a free video series at hopeforhealingfoundation.org. Just click on the free stuff tab. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed, A Journey Through Depression, and You Got This, An Action Plan to Calm Fear, Anxiety, Worry, and Stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner. 